So, I want to talk mostly about water and, and, and then get to the, the idea of the role of water in health, which is perhaps different from what, what you might imagine. But I think for most of you, uh, the, the idea, the subject of water, you know, what's in this cup, you'd think that, you know, science, water is a, among the simplest molecules around and it's the most abundant and you'd think that everything there is to know about water must already be known. And let me start by dispelling or attempting to dispel that notion. I want to show you a few, a few uh, slides of some things that you see all the time, but perhaps you don't really understand. These are things related to water. The first is the cloud up in the sky. This is a familiar scene, but did you ever uh, ask the question of um, how come in some cases there's only one cloud the vapor is rising all over. Why shouldn't you see a continuous cloud that spans uh, above, above the water? So probably that's something that you haven't asked yourself, but it's a question that remains unanswered. Another one is looking at water droplets hitting water. And as you see from this video, they don't, the two don't coalesce instantly. You think that water meeting water should uh, coalesce, but it, it, it doesn't happen. Why? And how come you don't know the answer if, if you think that everything there is to know about water is, is already known? And here's another example. Uh, you, this is a laboratory example. You take two beakers and you fill the beakers with water and you put the, lip, put the beakers lip to lip and you put one electrode in one and one electrode in the other and you put a high voltage between them and this is what happens. A bridge forms, that's okay, but now if you move one beaker away from the other, the bridge sustains itself and it sustains itself over a distance of several centimeters, um, practically a, a, an inch or so, and it sustains itself indefinitely. How do you explain this? So if you know all there is to know about water, you ought to be able to explain not only this, but the previous slides that I showed, but it's not so easy to explain them. So um, I, that's a, a starting point. There's a lot about water that we don't know, don't understand. For, for me, my interest in water started before uh, I, I wrote this book, Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life. The book attempted to, to uncover the role of water in biology, particularly cell biology. And without going into detail, the, uh, the upshot, the outcome of this book was, I think, a reasonable thesis that almost everything the cell does, every important thing the cells in, in, in your body do, involve water in, in, in some central way, much more so than any textbooks would, would have, you, have you think. And one of the, one of the key areas in, in this book was, was how the water molecules uh, aligned themselves or oriented themselves. So inside your cell, mostly the solids inside the cell are proteins, and this is, uh, represents one of them. And, and uh, the protein surfaces are charged, and the water molecules sitting next to it, your cell is two-thirds two -thirds water by, by volume, uh, they're represented by these little dipoles that you see here. Each one is a water molecule. And um, the dipoles are plus and minus. They're um, opposite charges at either, either end. And because of these charges, they tend to stick to the protein surface. And this stickiness actually um, uh, w w uh, persists for at least several uh, water molecular layers. And, and, and sometimes more, and, and, and eventually, because of thermal motion or Brownian motion, you know, things tend to jiggle around, the order is lost. One of the issues in the book was that this ordering extends not just uh, two or three uh, molecular layers, but, but much farther than, than the chemists would, would have you, so that inside your body, the water molecules are almost like crystalline in, 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 in organization, not randomly moving about as, as water in, in a glass. And because of this crystalline nature, you know, when crystals form, just like ice, as ice forms, it's pure. It pushes out all of the impurities, all of the junk and or whatever, whatever there is in it. Uh, and, and so, um, it, as I said, it, it tends to be devoid of, of all of the 
particles and, and what have you. And so we were looking for an experimental way to study this kind of water because, you know, if, if this is the water that's inside your body, inside your cells, it's rather important to understand in order to understand health, the health of your, of your cells. And by chance, we came upon um, uh, an experimental preparation uh, that we could use to study it, and it's shown here. So this is a gel, just like Jello, uh, but a different one. And it's sitting in a chamber, and next to the, to the gel, we put some water, and the water contained little particles. Um, these particles are little spheres. We call them microspheres. They're commonly used, nothing, nothing special, just spherical in shape. And we noticed that there is a region right next to the boundary of the cell where uh, these, these particles were excluded. And we thought, you know, it's possible that, that this region right here might correspond to this kind of ordered water that I, uh, I, I mentioned. But actually, the situation was more dramatic than that because over time, See, it looked as though there's a zone that's growing and it's pushing out uh, the microspheres. And once the microspheres were pushed out, uh, they never came back into the, that region. They would undergo their usual motion, so-called Brownian motion, jiggling around, but they never went back into that, that zone. Um, and we thought, if this really represents um, the ordering of water, then this is pretty big. This is, uh, um, well... Uh, about 50 micrometers, which is half the thickness of one of your hairs, and by molecular standards, is huge. Um, so we we and this is now um, si since this region tended to exclude particles, uh, someone suggested we should give it a name, and now it's called the exclusion zone, or EZ for short, and so it's, you know, easy to remember, easy, easy water. <laughs> uh, we uh, began seeing this uh, very commonly. This is a, uh, another example. This is, instead of a gel, this is a, a polymer. It's called naphion, and it comes in thin sheets. You can take the sheets, and you can cut them to whatever, whatever shape you desire. Here, it's an arrowhead, and you take it and just plunk it down in the chamber, and dump in some water with the suspended microspheres. And you can see the same sort of phenomenon. There's a zone here, and this zone excludes the particles. And again, it grows over time. This, what I'm going to show you, is actually over about five minutes or so. Oops. Um, let's try this again. Yeah, so it keeps growing. And in the case of Nafion, it grows really big. It's approximately half a millimeter. Uh, and half a millimeter, you don't even need a microscope to see it. You can see it with your naked eye. And for those of us who are eye visually impaired, a little magnifying glass does the trick. Well, we found this about um, eight or nine years ago or ten years ago. And since then, a lot of people in different countries, different laboratories have repeated the experiments and confirmed that there are many more than are on, on the list. So we know that this is... Uh, an easily identifiable phenomenon, identifiable phenomenon. So what I want to do is um, um, answer uh, five questions. Uh, is the exclusion phenomenon general or just those two kinds of uh, examples? Uh, does it really arise from the ordering of water? Can we, if, if it's the ordering of water, can we use it to explain those first few slides that I, I showed. Um, and in order to create order, you must have energy, a basic thermodynamic principle. And so where, where, where on earth could the energy come from to, to build this? And might these findings apply broadly, particularly to health? Okay, so question one about generality. Um, I'll, I'll just summarize. We've tried many material surfaces and in, in general, although not every, every instance, if we, we try gels, uh, polymers, biological surfaces, and monolayers, single molecular layer sheet with a single molecular layer, and we found in almost all cases, as long as it's hydro, the surface is hydrophilic, that is water-loving, 
th this occurs, this buildup, um, this exclusion that I, I mentioned to you. And then you might say, well, okay, so those surfaces tend to build this exclusion zone. What's excluded from it? A lot of things. Um, we found that uh, starting from large particles to small particles, large molecules to small molecules, um, practically everything is excluded down to molecular weight approximately 100 or so. And, uh, and perhaps even salts are excluded. We, we, we have data on that, but the data remain so far um, inconclusive. It's just preliminary. I just want to give you one example. Um, one example is to use a dye. Because you can see a dye, and if it's excluded from some region, there's no dye, no color. And one of the dyes that we use is uh, a, a pH-sensitive dye. So maybe you remember from your chemistry classes about litmus paper. You stick the litmus paper in, and you know if, if it's acid, it turns one color. If it's base, it turns another color. And you can get those dyes um, as, as chemicals, and they dissolve in water. And you can use them, dump in water to check the pH of the, of the water. And, and um, they just change color, with, uh, just as, as in litmus paper. And that's what we used. Um, so, and, and the molecules, the, the dye molecules, are roughly molecular weight roughly 100 or so. So we can test if size 100 is excluded or not excluded. And so this is the, the experiment. And down at the bottom is a piece of naphion and the exclusion zone right next to it and water. That's all with dye. And so look at the pretty colors of the dye. It looks like a, it's a lovely rainbow. But what I want to, um, and, and the different colors represent different pH values. But I just want to point out that this is colorless right here, and therefore the dye is excluded. So that's the main point of the slide, is that chemicals roughly molecular at 100 are excluded from the exclusion zone. But more, sig more significant is the color distribution, because it's beautiful but weird. And what the color distribution represents is that you have a lot of protons here. This is very low pH, uh, acidic, so to speak, and it goes uh, eventually back toward, toward neutral. This is important, and I'll come back to it uh, in a moment. So for the first question about generality, um, I just want to conclude by saying that many hydrophilic surfaces, water-loving surfaces, generate exclusion zones, and many solutes are excluded. So it's quite general. The second question is whether this zone is physically different from bulk water. Bulk water, I mean this kind of water that you have in, in a glass. And there's a lot of scientific evidence. I don't want to go through each one, otherwise I'll use up all my time and you'll, you'll be yawning. And so I just want to list the evidence to demonstrate that the evidence is there. And most of it's been published. If anybody is seriously interested, it's possible, um, possible to look at those publications. And the first is that the easy water molecules are more constrained, more tightly constrained, than uh, molecules of water in the glass and using the nuclear magnetic resonance uh, technique. Uh, second is that they're more stable, they're sitting in, in place. The third one is that they're not neutral. So you expect water to be neutral, but the EZ water is typically negatively charged. And I'll go back to that because it's really centrally important for, for everything, including the fact that you're negatively charged. It absorbs light. This is in the ultraviolet region at a wavelength of 270 nanometers. And ordinary water doesn't do that. And pardon me if I use the word bulk water, ordinary water. This is the common lingo. It's more viscous than ordinary water. It's kind of like honey. Um, the molecules are aligned, as I, I mentioned to you. Uh, the molecular structure is different. And the optical properties uh, differ as well. By optical properties, I mean the refractive index. This was measured by uh, a couple of Russian groups independently, and they got the same result. It's more dense. Uh, than ordinary water. The refractive index is higher and it bends light. As a, and there are a couple of, couple of more that I, I haven't listed here. Um, so th there's a fair amount of evidence that this water is really distinctly different from, from 
uh, water in, in the glass. So let me just focus on this one because um, this is a critically important one, the negative charge. So how, how do we find, how do we determine that this has negative charge? Okay, so the way we do it, uh, pardon if this is slightly uh, complicated, is we take a chamber uh, shown here, and the inside means inside of a gel. So the, in, in this instance, it's a polyacrylic acid gel, PAA, polyacrylic acid gel, and the outside is water. So gel, water, and this is the region between the two where there should be an exclusion zone. We were curious to check the electrical properties uh, uh, of, of this region. We really didn't expect much, but we decided to, to see what we could find. Um, and uh, to, me to measure the electrical properties, you need two electrodes to measure the electrical potential. So we used two electrodes. These are very finely tapered electrodes made of glass, commonly used for 60 years to stick into cells to measure the electrical potential of the cell. So we have a reference electrode that we put somewhere out here. And the probe electrode, uh, we move with a motor from point to point to check the electrical potential. Okay, so first, the probe electrode is sitting out at this point right here. And the potential difference between here and the outside reference is zero. And that makes sense because basically you're just putting two electrodes into water somewhere. Now, as we moved it closer and closer, the real surprise was that the electrical potential uh, just roughly uh, uh, corresponding to the exclusion zone be began to get negative and it went actually quite negative down to about 120 millivolts negative. And at first, at first we, we thought this must be some error because why would there be such a huge, by molecular standards, negatively charged zones? And the fellow is working with me, a Russian guy, telephoned his wife, who was using gels and electrodes, and within two days she had confirmed the same result. So we knew we were, we were on to something confirmed in, in, in Russia. And the next is we thought, well, maybe this is something specific to this particular gel. So instead of a gel, we put a piece of naphion, which I mentioned to you creates a rather big exclusion zone shown here. Um, and we did the same experiment. And you can see the result is kind of similar, but the region of negativity begins farther from the interface here, and it actually gets more negative, goes down, down to here. So it looks like this exclusion zone is negatively charged. It doesn't matter what substance is, if it creates an exclusion zone, the exclusion zone is, is, is negatively charged. If that's true, it's weird, because it doesn't make any sense. Uh, you know, what the experiment, think of the experiment. You have a chamber and you pour <laughs> some of, of this water in, the water's neutral. So how is it possible that from neutral water you get a relatively large region that bears negative charge? Uh, the only possible reason you could conceive of is, th is that the water molecules are somehow splitting to, to the negative part and the positive part. And the negative part is accumulating in this region. And if so, there should be some positive charges uh, outside. But, you know, wh where are those positive charges if, if that's true? They should be somewhere out here. And is there any evidence for those positive charges? And the answer is you've already seen the evidence. So... This slide, shown um, a few slides ago, I've turned it 90 degrees to match the previous slide in, in orientation. So here's the naphion. Remember, here's the exclusion zone with no dye. And in the previous slide, I, I showed you that the electrodes show that it has net negative charge. So where is the positive charge? Well, it's right here. This is full of protons. So indeed, it looks as though the water molecules are splitting somehow. And the negative charges are accumulating here, and the positive charges are accumulating here. Um, and just to make sure that we're not fooling ourselves or deluding ourselves into thinking that something is correct that's not correct, we, we decided to check it by putting one electrode in the negative reason, region, another electrode in the positive region, connecting them through a resistor. Now, if this is really true, you've got negative and positive, it's kind of like a battery, you should have current that flows from the positive to the negative. This is what we confirmed. This is current, 
as a function of time. So the current starts at some high value, it goes down, but it doesn't go to zero, it goes down to some plateau value. So current is constantly flowing from the positive region to the negative region. And this confirms that really there are charges that are separated. So our hypothesis seems reasonable that somehow the water molecules are splitting into the positive and negative components. And, and essentially what it means is that you have a, a basically a charged battery in water. So here is the nafion or whatever nucleating surface. Here's the water. And this is the EZ region which has negative charge and positive charge here. I'll show you later that we can actually get electrical energy out of this. So, main point that I wanted to uh, illustrate was the EZ has negative charge. Now, um, what's the structure of this zone? Um, I suggested to you that the molecules were all lined up, but at least uh, from a primitive point of view, these three properties the molecules are aligned, they're stable and constrained. What, what can we say about, about the structure? We, we're just presuming that the molecules are lined up. Well, this is the characteristic of a liquid crystal. And I'll get back to that in a moment because the structure of this zone is absolutely critical for, for understanding, including understanding of what goes on inside your cells, inside your body. So, so far, we, we, we've shown that this ordered region is like a like a liquid crystal. It's not neutral, it has negative charge. It excludes solutes profoundly. And there's a hint from some of those experimental results that it's not just dipoles that are um, lined up like this, but something different, we'll get to that. And it may extend very far. So how far is it very far? Well, those of you who are not in the field of chemistry, which means practically everybody, <laughs> um, may not appreciate this, but the, the common view in chemistry is that if you have a surface, a charged surface next to water, that the water molecules may line up a bit, but it doesn't go beyond two or three molecular layers. Here, if these experimental findings are correct, we're talking about two or three million molecular layers. So it's a big difference between the conventional view and what the experimental results seem to imply. Well. A hundred years ago, a famous chemist, Sir William Hardy, suggested that water doesn't really have three phases. We, we, that's what we learn as, as children. We learn you know, water has a solid phase and a liquid phase and a vapor phase. He said, that doesn't explain all the properties of water. A hundred years ago, he said, there must be a fourth phase. And through the years, a lot of people had been scratching their collective heads thinking about the possibility of a fourth phase. And, and I, I, I'm not sure, but um, I, I think what I, I've shown you is actually the long sought fourth phase of water. It qualifies in, in that the structure is different, it's bounded, and it responds to temperature and pressure. So, so what I've shown you may be classified as a fourth phase of water. Now, what about the structure? Why would anybody want to question the idea of these little dipoles lined up? It's such a beautiful picture. I had these pictures in my previous book, and many people have had similar pictures. So <laughs> why, why would we suggest that we're collectively wrong? And the answer is actually pretty obvious. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to, uh, to figure it out. So I showed you that this region has negative charge, Dipoles don't have negative charge. Dipoles plus minus are neutral. So you can take a, a surface and stack dipoles of water from here to the moon, if you like, and you'll never get negative charge. You'll get zero uh, charge. So it means that this model has to be wrong, and we want to get the right model. There's another argument also, which is less major. I, I mentioned this absorption of light by the exclusion zone at 270 nanometers. And usually, ring-like structures absorb in this wavelength region, not dipoles, less major. So, so something, is, something is grossly amiss with the idea of stacked dipoles. So what's the structure? Well, we started with the idea that there should be some kind of precedent 
uh, as a hypothesis. That is, if we can identify some known structure of water in one of its phases, maybe this is a variant on that particular structure. No guarantee, but at least it's better than pulling a rabbit from a hat. Um, and, and so, w what structure do we really know? Well, we don't really know the vapor structure. We really don't know the structure of ordinary liquid water, surprisingly. Uh, there are many ideas on it, but they're all different. But ice, as I said, ice is a crystal, and, and crystals are really easy to study, or, well, easier than, than other phases of water. And so we thought about ice, and this is uh, essentially the structure of, of ice, the molecular or atomic structure of, of ice. And these, these, you see these... Um, hexagonal sheets that are basically stacked on, on one another, and these red dots represent oxygens. And of course, in water you have oxygens and hydrogens, and the hydrogens, not shown here to keep it simple, lie halfway in between these two oxygens here, here, and, and, and so on. Okay, so if you look at the same structure from a different angle, it looks like this, and so now you begin, uh, on the right side, you begin to lose, um, lose the sense of hexagonality, but you do pick up something else, that is these blue dots that you can see in between the, uh, the red ones, in between the oxygens, and these blue dots are protons, positively charged. So it's kind of cool because you have this positive charge linking the two negative charges right here, and glue it, basically gluing them together, and that's why ice is solid. So we thought, maybe some variant on this structure um, might represent the EZ structure. Um, and so we thought, well, you know, we, we, we need something negative. Ice is neutral, we need negative. So how can we, how can we go from, from from neutral to negative, and you know, the obvious idea is, is just uh, basically pull out these protons. If you remove the protons, then you get negative charge, which is what we need. And also, it's not solid anymore. It's not rock solid, and the EZ is not rock solid. So, so we thought this is a, this is a good approach. And um, I, I remember being excited about, about this possibility until someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, you know, this is a great attempt, but unfortunately, it's got a problem. And what's the problem? It's impossible. So, so why is it impossible? Well, the reason it's impossible is that if you pull out the positive charge that link these two negatives, then the two negatives are sitting right next to each other, and everybody knows that negatives repel. So the whole thing flies apart, and it won't work. It's unstable. So after... Um, after a few weeks of antidepressants, <laughs> uh, um, I, I remember this happened on a flight from Japan to Seattle, where I live. Suddenly, something came, and, and, um, and I think we were on to something. That is, it works really well if you take these two layers and just shift one relative to another, as, as, as shown here. These are just two of many layers. And, um, and by doing this, what happens is that negative and positive charges line up next to each other. So here, uh, um, you can see that the oxygen uh, atom in, in the layer behind matches up in position with the positive uh, hydrogen that sits just above it. And the two stick to one another, plus sticking to minus. And that happens not only here, but uh, you can see in many places, one-third of the oxygens are linked to hydrogen, so it sticks together. So it's stable. It's not unstable. It doesn't fly apart. And this structure seems to have a lot of promise to it. And so, so what I'm showing you is, is that you have some kind of uh, hydrophilic material sitting next to water, and out of the water um, forms these individual layers with hexagonal motifs, and they build, and they build, and so on. And if you look at the structure of one of those layers, it looks just like this, as, as, as I've demonstrated to you. And, uh, you know, here the hydrogens are, are restored. And if you ask yourself, what's the chemical structure of this? It's not H2O. 
H2O is usual water. It's actually H3O2. And H3O2 makes sense because, because if, if this has a negative charge, if it were neutral, you'd need H4O2, sort of like H2O1. It's a double of that, H4O2. So this is my, missing a positive, and therefore it's net negative charge, which is what we need. So it looks like it suffices for that. Now, in order to, in, in order to, uh, to achieve that, what I've done is I've shifted one layer, the hexagon, to the right by a fixed, a fixed amount. But I, this was arbitrary. If I were in Asia, I might have shifted it um, to the left and got the same result because of symmetry or, or 60 degrees or 120 degrees, uh, what have you. So, so they're all the same because of, because of symmetry. And why, why is that important? Well, it's important because, because by this ability to shift in different directions, you can build a helix. So here you can see a, a helical kind of structure. Uh, and why, and I, I've done this by, this is level zero. Level one is shifted by zero degrees, 60 degrees, 120 degrees. So you get this nice helix. So why is a helix important? Well, in biology, so many molecules are helical. Um, so, um, fibrous proteins have a helical structure, DNA, RNA, and such. Nature likes helices, and it's known that next to all of these molecules are some kind of, at least a few layers of structured water. Not ordinary water, but organized. And so this kind of structure suffices because it conforms to those kinds of uh, requirements. So the advantages of this structure, this non-dipolar EZ, is number one, Precedent, as I said, it's not pulled from a hat. It resembles ice, and it's just a slight modification of the ice structure. It has negative charge, as the experimental results dictate. The ring-like structures might account for the absorption of light in the ultraviolet region that you see here. It's able to accommodate helical structures, and the crystal-like structure can actually be solidified. So, so um, this is, uh, it, and actually, I'm going to show you a slide. This has actually been confirmed that this water, this kind of water, can exist at a, as a solid at room temperature. So this is like solid water at room temperature. And it's demonstrated by um, an Italian group, Vittorio Elia. And um, you take, scrape off this easy water and put it through a freeze-dry process. And um, the res result is solid at the bottom of the flask. And you can scrape it out and feel it. And this is basically solid water, water at room temperature. And it's, it's really an amazing, amazing finding. And so one of the interesting features uh, of, of this is that this kind of structure, this sort of semi-solid structure, can actually store information. Now, information storage in water may seem weird to you, but I organize each year uh, the um, annual conference on the physics, chemistry, and biology of water. This year it's in Bulgaria. And at the conference, usually there are two or three groups who provide clear evidence that the water has the capacity to store information. If you put some kind of energy into it, the water changes, and that change, it actually persists. Um, there were some studies 20 years ago, so-called, or 30 years ago, so-called water memory studies, and they were ridiculed because, uh, because everybody knows that in ordinary water, the molecules are randomly oriented and moving around at a gazillion times per second, and there's no way for that to store any kind of uh, information um, and, and, and so the people who were doing the experiments were widely ridiculed. And in fact, uh, uh, a famous uh, immunologist, Jacques Benvenis, basically lost his career as a, as a result of that. However, his experiments have been repeated and confirmed many times. So something is going on. And it's possible that this kind of water, so-called EZ water, does have the capacity to store information because it's a semi-solid, sort of like a computer memory with molecules or atoms of silicon, silicon dioxide 
uh, oriented in a regular array. This is actually rather similar to that, as, as you can see here. And, um, and, and also, it's possible that the protein, or whatever it is that nucleates the water structure, also can confer information. So if you think about the protein or the surface, um, any kind of uh, generic nucleator, and I've just shown here, just by plus minus, this is a sort of generic protein surface or, or surface of DNA, if you will, and this is, has no particular information, it's plus minus, plus minus, boringly, forever and 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 the water the easy water that builds from such a surface has no particular information however a real nucleating surface um, does contain information because the surface charge of each molecule is unique and so I've just drawn here a couple of circles instead of two minuses this could be for example another plus right here um, different from from the generic surface and as the water builds from this easy water builds from the surface, it imparts information. So the, the layer of water adjacent to that is different from, from the usual. And this information, um, so-called defects, can project over many easy layers. And basically, this is information. Information conferred by the nucleating surface that builds this water. But there's another way of imparting information using electromagnetic information. So the idea is that this information is imparted into the water and if there's some EZ water that's here, then you can see that um, the, the, the uh, water itself may be impacted in, in some or many layers if the vibratory modes are similar in frequency to, the, to what's coming in, into the water and that can actually remain as, as information and these Vibratory modes now uh, can also be uh, imparted into the energy that's coming out. So, so this is a way that the water can change, the easy water can change depending on the information that, that comes in. And this has been shown actually by now several groups, including especially um, Luc Montagnier, who won the Nobel Prize uh, for his work on HIV is, is doing these experiments right now with amazing uh, results. Um, and so, so it's just to demonstrate that for easy water, not for ordinary water, for easy water, input electromagnetic energy can create information. And, um, uh, and the way, so the, the way that, as I alluded to, that this can occur, um, the, the um, easy, the electromagnetic waves can um, impact certain of these oxygen uh, atoms. And uh, so, for example, <laughs> just uh, shown here or here or whatever. And the oxygen atoms, each, oxidation, each oxygen atom has five oxidation states, minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two. So the capacity for information of just one of these sites is huge. In the case of an ordinary digital uh, uh, memory, um, it's either zero or one. But here, you have five possible options. So this is an amazing, has amazing capacity for energy, for information uh, storage. Huge information storage capacity. And so a question is, will the information storage in easy water ever replace conventional information uh, storage? And and also, will the information storage in this easy water impact health? And as I said, evidence is piling up that this is a critically important issue for, for health. Okay, so the answer to question uh, two is, is the easy physically distinct from the bulk? And the answer is yes. It appears to be a layered honeycomb structure. Okay, now, what uh, question three is, can the crystalline water explain those first few slides? And what do we expect from a crystal? Well, the first is that crystalline elements stick together. You've, you've seen salt crystals, sugar crystals, they, they, they stick. And now think of the dessert that you might have had last night. Um, gelatin dessert, it's mostly water. It's 95% water. And a question that you may or may not have asked is, how come the water doesn't dribble out? You know, 95% water should come out like a, 
like a dribbling faucet, but it doesn't do that, and you've, you've had the experience, and so the question is, well, how come? And I've actually handed, handled gels that are not 95% water, but 99.95% water, and the water stays in. How is this possible? If you look at the structure uh, of, a, of a typical gel that looks like this, the yellow is, is a, a protein or a polymer uh, matrix, and it's got these giant uh, holes, gaps in, in between that look like this. And so, so the rest is water. Um, so how come the water doesn't leak out? Well, the reason we've surmised is that the water that's in here is not ordinary H2O. It's sitting next to a hydrophilic surface, and the hydrophilic surface builds easy layers next to it. So the water that's in here is actually not H2O. It's filled with EZ water, and the EZ water sticks to the surface, and layers stick to one another, and that's why they stay inside. They don't uh, leak out. And another thing is, you may have asked, well, a gel has this peculiar consistency. And probably when you were a kid, you sort of wondered. Uh, we lose our wonder as we get older, but you probably maybe remember wondering about the structure of jello or, or raw egg white. Really peculiar, weird kind of uh, consistency. But why does it have this consistency? And I think the answer is because the easy water is gel-like. And if, the, if it's filled with EZ water, remember 99.95%, it's this kind of water that confers th this consistency. Okay, another observation um, is uh, maybe you've had the experience um, of taking a pin and taking a glass of water and putting the pin on the surface. If you put it beneath the surface, it plunks right down to the bottom. But if you put it on the surface, either a pin or a paper clip or this coin, or whatever, it floats. Well, how is this possible? Because the coin or the clip is denser than the water, so it ought to go right to the bottom. But it doesn't if you're careful about doing this. And uh, um, we, we decided to, the, usually the usual answer is, well, water has a high surface tension for whatever uh, uh, reason. And, and, and so uh, maybe that's the answer. And we decided to study to see what happens at the interface between the air and, and the water. And we found that this crystalline water, the easy water, grows at the top, at this, at this interface. And the experiment is, is shown here. It's two plates, uh, and we glue them together to make a, a little chamber. Uh, and we put water and the particles, the microspheres, in it. So this is air. Here's the meniscus, and then and the water and microspheres. It's cloudy because the microspheres scatter the light. And what we found, surprisingly, is that over 15, 20 minutes or so, a clear zone develops. In other words, a zone that has no microspheres, very similar to the EZ. So it looked like an EZ might be forming at, at the surface. And we stuck an electrode in here, and we confirm the negative electrical potential, just like EZs. And the next slide will, will demonstrate that this is not water. This has a, a it, it behaves mechanically like a thick gel-like band, uh, just like we expect in an EZ. And, and the experiment is shown here. So the bottom part is just what you've seen in the, in the past uh, slide with this clear zone sitting at the top. And we're going to take a rod and, and touch the surface and move it around. And despite this mechanical perturbation, you're going to see that the thickness of this zone from here to here hardly changes at all. It's cohesive. It sticks together. So now we're going up. Look at the height of that. And we're going left, right. And you can see that this clear, clear zone, it sticks together. And so it, it behaves like a sort of like a rubber band or a, a gel. And so, so the answer to this is that the reason this is supported is that there are many layers, many structured layers that create the high surface tension. And that's why when you stick a paper clip on the surface, it actually floats. It also explains this phenomenon. Uh, perhaps you've, you've seen this is a Central uh, American lizard. Um, and um, what it does, it sits on the branch, and then it jumps into the water, and it walks on water. So it's called the Jesus Christ lizard because it walks on, <laughs> on water. 
and, and there you go. And, and so you can understand this because there's a thick, thick, easy layer that sits on the, so, uh, on the top that prevents sinking. And the same is true of the water dropping on the water. So when the water drops on the water, it's not H2O meeting H2O. It's actually an easy layer that sits at the top that I've just shown you. And also the, this pendant droplet also is exposed to the air, so you have the water-air interface, and it too develops an EZ. So when you drop the droplet on the water, it's not water meeting water, it's EZ meeting EZ. And, and the two will, will coalesce based on the properties of EZ, not on the properties of H2O, and that's why it takes some time to happen. Also, crystals can be pretty stiff. Any of you who have a diamond or a, a ruby or something, those are crystals. And, 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 and so it's this observation uh, of the floating uh, water bridge is really stiff, otherwise it would be drooping quite a lot, but it sticks together. And, and you can understand that H2O doesn't explain this, but if this is a crystal, then potentially it can be explained. Another point is that um, this crystalline zone keeps the uh, protons out. What do I mean by this? Well, there, the, there, there's a question that should be arising in your mind, or maybe you feel a little uneasy about this. Easy is negative, and this region is, is positive. This is where the protons are. Actually, they're hydronium ions. That is a proton. Uh, sticks onto the water, this is well known, to form um, a hydronium ion. So the hydronium ion is like water molecule with a positive charge on it. And of course, it's positive, and this region is negative, so a question in your mind would be, how come these positives don't join the negatives and annihilate one another and cancel everything out? How can they stay separated? This is a, g a good question, and I think the answer is, is uh, that the structure of the EZ, remember the structure consists of hexagonal sheets. These hexagons are very small, and it's hard for this char positively charged water molecule to make their way through. And it's not just that the space here is the hexagon, but remember, each sheet is displaced from the one next to it, and so this little tunnel that they would have to go through in order to get in here is so small that they simply can't fit. So the two charges are kept separated, and we know they are because we can stick in a, uh, they remain separated. We can stick an electrode in here and an electrode in here, measure the potential difference, and it's sustained essentially indefinitely. So they really don't, uh, the positives don't, don't get in. So um, the answer to question three is yes, liquid crystalline water explains many uh, anomalies and uh, and most importantly, it explains why the battery charges really do remain separated. Okay, so the question is, what charges the water battery? Every battery needs to get charged. Your cell phone battery, you stick into to the wall, uh, right, into the receptacle, and, um, and you recharge it, otherwise it dies down. So where's the energy come from to separate these charges? Well, we scratched our heads for several years, because we couldn't figure it out. And then one day, a student in the laboratory did a peculiar experiment. The students, these are, a lot of them are undergraduate students, and they're kind of free to do what they like. We give them a lot of license. And we had the chamber sitting right here in front of us, uh, similar to chambers I've shown you early on. And there was a lamp, and, and, um, um, and, and the student took the lamp, and shined it on here, and the exclusion zone grew with that light. And so it wasn't long before we figured out that, that incident radiant energy light photons are responsible. That's the energy that's responsible for building the exclusion zone and separating the charge. So the experiment looked, that the student did looked like this. Um, this is real data, and this is a, obviously a sketch of the lamp that he used. And so this is a piece of naphion and here is the exclusion zone, and here are the microspheres. And in the region that was illuminated, you can see that the exclusion zone grew, and it, it, it grew very substantially. And when he took the lamp away, it went back down to the original, so it was reversible. So we, we uh, quickly started to do 
uh, real experiments uh, and uh, different wavelengths to see which wavelengths of light were the most important. I don't want to go through this because it takes too much time. We found that the most powerful light, the most powerful wavelength or color, if you will, is infrared light. You shine infrared and this thing grows like crazy. So your question is, well, where does infrared light come from? Uh, you know, I, I know that I can see the, the glowing coils of the toaster or the electric range and they're generating infrared, but actually infrared energy is coming from everywhere. Um, it, it's coming from uh, um, the walls, uh, it's coming from you, it's coming from the table, it's coming from the iPhone. Everything is, is generating infrared and you can, you can determine that by turning off all the lights and taking an infrared camera, that is, it's like a regular camera, but it's not sensitive to visible light, only infrared light, that's longer wavelengths. And if this is completely dark, pitch black, and I take an image, I get a beautiful image of everything. So it's used as a camera, a night, night camera, for example. So it's all over. Uh, it means, basically, it's free. It's literally free energy. It comes, and it's really actually even hard to get rid of. So, so it's there to build, to build the EZ. And so you have a situation like this a hydrophilic material next to water. And depending on how much infrared there is in coming in um, to the system, you have a certain amount of easy water. And if you were to increase the amount of infrared light by some, some source of some sort, it actually builds more. And if you take it away, it goes back to the, the original. So the answer, answer to question four about energy is that Easy build, easy build up is powered by photonic energy, light, basically. It orders the water and it charges the water battery. And so the situation is just like, <laughs> you know, um, uh, Hawaii. <laughs> just, just lie there in, in light and, um, and you, get, you get energy from that. It's very simple. It requires no effort. Now, so, now, if this water is receiving energy from light all the time, you'd expect that you might capitalize that on that and harvest the energy in some useful way. But I, I would bet that not one of you has ever seen water, a glass of water doing work. This is absurd. But I want to demonstrate to you that it can. And um, so, um, so this is a simple experiment. This is another undergraduate student uh, doing his own thing uh, in contradistinction to what I asked him to do. <laughs> and, and one day um, he, he came walking into my office to tell me and I almost fell out of my chair. So, so the experiment is simple. Remember Nafion, um, I told you it builds a, a large exclusion zone. We found that it also came in tubes like this, like a straw. And so we took a section of this, put it in the water and, and also uh, put some little spheres in the water so we could actually see what was going on with a microscope lens just beneath here, looking into here. And he came running into my office excitedly. I had someone in the office and he barged in and he said, I found something that's really interesting. And okay, don't bother me, I'm in the middle of a conversation. He said, he said that inside this tube the water is flowing constantly without stop. He thought it was interesting. I thought that if true, it was astonishing because in order to drive water through a tube, you need energy. And there's no obvious sort of, well, usually it's a pressure gradient that does it, like your heart is generating pressure and driving the, the um, blood through your arteries, right? But there's no pressure difference here. There's no heart, there's no, no pump, no generator. This thing is just sitting here and yet, yet there's flow. And the first thing we did, of course, was to confirm that this was not some error of some sort. Um, and, 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 and so the, the experiment is shown here. Uh, first, you fill the inside of the tube with water just to make sure there are no air bubbles. And then you plunk it down into the chamber of water with the particles, with the microsphere, put it in the microscope, look in the microscope, and here's what you see. So, the Nafion tube, here's Nafion exclusion zone next to the Nafion. 
and all of the particles are outside the exclusion zone and they just keep flowing. We've had it going for a day and a half without stopping. And we thought, well, maybe this is something that's peculiar just to the Nathion tube. And so we tried other systems and, and we used gels. So we take a, a, a gel and, and as it was gelling, we put a, a, a wire inside and then pull the wire out just as it was gelling. And so you get a chunk of gel with a tunnel that's inside. You take the, the, the gel with the tunnel, stick it in the water with the microspheres, and um, this is what you get. So this is a polyacrylic acid gel here, and here's the tunnel. Uh, and you could see, of course, there's an EZ next to the gel, an EZ next to the gel, and all of the particles then are confined to this uh, central region. And um, if you look at the video, you can see it flows. And so we used no fewer than a half dozen different gels and got a similar result. The speed is different, but basically that's it. And, and, and uh, so someone, someone said, uh, well, if you think that this is powered by light energy, why don't you just turn up the lights a little bit and see if it goes faster? We tried that experiment, and we could actually um, ha get it to go up to five times faster just by shining light on it. So we're quite sure that this is run by light, light energy, um, which builds the EZ and separates the charge. And so we have a situation with a hollow tube in water. And in order to drive water through a tube, work is done because the water has viscosity. And if work is done, energy is required. And, and the energy, we found, comes from the light that's being absorbed by the water, which builds the EZ and separates the charge that's necessary to drive it. So, so, um, so we confirm that, that this energy that's coming into the water can actually be used to do work. You can harvest this kind of energy in a system like this. And so the water basically is a transducer of light energy. It converts the light energy into mechanical energy. This water does that. Now, it sounds strange to hear that, but just think about it. You have a plant that's sitting on your windowsill. Where does the energy come from? Well, it comes from light. The light is absorbed, and the light is transduced into chemical potential, which drives uh, metabolism, growth, bending, you, you name it. And I'm suggesting that the same thing is happening in the water, and it's no surprise because, uh, I shouldn't say the same, similar in the water, it's no surprise because the plant is mostly water. So, so we, we come up with the equation, uh, if you will, E equals H2O. It looks like a famous iconic equation, but, but I, <laughs> what I really mean and I apologize because the units don't match, uh, but, but I think you know what I mean, that if you've got water, you've got energy. There's energy that's being imparted into water all the time, and this energy in the right situation can be harvested. Okay, final question. Why is all of this important? And I, I think uh, that it's possible that this, these findings about water can be foundational for any or all science involving water and molecules and light. And that's, that's a, a lot of uh, possibilities. And just to summarize what I've, uh, starting this section, uh, what I've presented, I, I, I've suggested that uh, inside of water, if you have a particle or a, a molecule, that there's an exclusion zone around it, typically with negative charge, a big exclusion zone, and corresponding positive charges, protons or hydronium ions, that are spread all over. And all of this is powered by light. Now, if this is correct, then it should apply in all aqueous chemical reactions. And if you read a chemistry textbook, nothing of this appears in the textbook. So, so if it's right, one never knows, some experiment may overturn everything that we've presented and think we know. If, it, if it's correct, then it's going to impact every the interpretation of every aqueous chemical reaction because they don't take into account this or this or this. So a question that arises is um, if you have two of these instead of one, so I, I take, for example, I take 
a negatively charged particle out of this pocket and a negatively charged particle out of this pocket. And I drop them in the water, pretty close to one another, so they can feel the other's charge. They're both negatively charged. And I ask a question of you, which, what will happen to the distance between them? And, um, okay, so, so one suggestion from back there is that the distance will increase. Everybody pretty much in agreement with that? Okay, and the answer is that it decreases. So, this is weird. However, it's been done, confirmed experimentally many times, and it's been known for a century that they actually approach one another. And um, this was actually discussed by the great physicist, perhaps the most important physicist of the last half of the 20th century, Richard Feynman, Nobel laureate. He talked about this very phenomenon, and he referred to it as like likes like. So you have like charges, and they like each other. And because they like each other, they come close. Not enough to hug, but they come uh, closer. And why do they do that? He said, like likes like because of an intermediate of unlikes. In other words, if these are positive, then he suggested that there, if these are negative, he suggested there will be positive charges gathering in between, and the positive charges pull the negative and pull the negative, so they come closer together. However, it was never clear where these positive charges come from. And I've demonstrated where they come from as this negatively charged EZ builds. Positive charges are generated out, complementary positive charges are out here. And in the middle, there are a lot of them because you get some coming from this EZ buildup and this EZ buildup. And so, because there are many of them here, these positives attract the negatives and they come together. Well, the phenomenon, like, likes, like, because of an intermediate of unlikes, is not new. The, the principle is actually a thousand years old. And a thousand years old, it actually appeared in the tale of Genji, the first novel. It was written in Japan roughly a, a thousand years ago. And it looks something like this. Um, you know, you have two clans that are at war with one another, and never will they ever get together unless the opposite is placed in between. And, and, and so, like, likes, like, because of an intermediate of, of unlike. And so, what happens is they, they come together, and when do they stop? Well, you, you have stability when the attractive force, that is plus, pulling, minus, pulling, minus, is equal to the repulsive force, this repelling this. Then they're stable. They stay right where they are. And if you have a lot of them, then you have a situation like this, which is called a colloid uh, crystal, uh, in, in which basically the particles are stuck together because of the like, likes, like principle. And if you had yogurt this morning, probably the consistency of the yogurt is explained by by this, the yogurt contains uh, colloidal particles with charge held together by the opposite uh, charge. This is a principle of self-assembly. That is, if you put these particles in the water, they automatically come together because of, of these, these charges. And, and, and in, in biology, in cell biology, one of the remaining questions is, how, how do these structures uh, form? So, there are lots of proteins that are generated by ribosomes, and nobody knows exactly how they form filaments and vesicles and such. And this is a simple principle. All you need is the particles, water, and light energy, and they come together. The question of origin of life is one that arises, and of course, none of us were there to, uh, to witness, but you can imagine that there, there was light, there was water and some particles or molecules spread out all over the earth, but doesn't do anything unless they come together to form a cell or some pre-cell or something like that. And nobody understands how that can happen, but this principle could apply because with those three entities, automatically they will come together to form a pre-cell or cell or something like this. So this may be important in the origin of life. Now, getting back to the clouds, so I asked the question earlier, since the water is evaporating from all over, how come you often see a single cloud or a few, uh, the sky is punctuated by a, a few of these, why not one long cloud? And somehow, 
the, the water that's evaporated must be, because it's evaporating everywhere, it must somehow be brought to, to, uh, to this growing cloud. And, and you can explain this by the like-likes-like mechanism. See, the, the vapor, the water vapor, comes in, in these uh, so-called uh, vesicles or uh, aerosol droplets, and they all have negative charge. See, and because they have negative charge, Ordinarily, you'd expect they would never come together because they repel. However, in the atmosphere, it's full of positive charge. And in situations where there's enough positive charge, the positive charge will glue them together by the like-likes-like mechanism. And so, if you've got another one of these vesicles here, it's going to be attracted to this positive charge and join the cloud. So, and there's lots of light available to, uh, to power this. Okay, so, uh, finally, what about biology and health? Uh, does biology use radiant energy? Um, now, we receive light, radiant energy, all the time. Some of this, depending on the wavelength, penetrates our clothing, our body. And um, now, if you, were, if you were Mother Nature, you have two choices. Um, you've been really successful with green plants, using light photosynthesis and some unicellular organisms also use light and, and now suddenly you're creating animals and you have two choices. One is to dispense with that mechanism and replace it by something else, food for example. We get our energy from food or you could still use the food and retain this kind of light-based energy that has been so successful, why would you throw it away? And, and so a suggestion is that maybe we use light. And I, I didn't throw a slide in, but there's actually in Mexico um, a center for human photosynthesis. Um, real surprise, but the guy who runs it is absolutely convinced that we, we use light. And I'm not sure if we use it, we certainly don't use it in the same way as, as, uh, as green plants, but the possibility is that we make use of the energy that we receive the light energy that we receive. Now, one possibility is the cardiovascular system. So, you know, light is incident on in our body. Some wavelengths actually penetrate pretty deeply. And the cardiovascular system, uh, the capillaries or such, are not far be beneath the, the superficial um, uh, level. And I started my career doing, studying the cardiovascular system. And the mechanical, uh, the dynamic, chemodynamic aspects, and I thought for sure that we understood everything. Until I met a colleague in Russia who introduced me to the guy next door who sat down with me for an hour and explained to me that there's a big problem in the cardiovascular system. So what's the big problem? Well, the problem is that your capillaries um, are pretty small. In fact, in, in young adults, capillaries can be down to three or four micrometers in diameter, but the red blood cells that need to pass through are bigger. They're actually six or seven micrometers. So you have a, you have a situation where you've got a narrow tube and a big blob that has to pass through the tube. And um, in order to, to shove this through, it's sort of like a clogged toilet, you know, uh, to, to, to shove everything through. You need to put some energy in a plunger or something like this. And the situation is not so different here. How do you get these red blood cells to pass through? And they calculated uh, that the amount of energy that could be supplied by the heart to do this is insufficient. It's not enough by something like a million times. In other words, if the heart were responsible for pushing these red blood cells through these very narrow uh, channels that would need to develop a pressure that's something like a million times higher than it actually does. So, we got a problem. Where does the energy come from to, to drive these things through? Well, uh, so, let, let me just, and you, uh, you know what I'm, what I'm getting to, the possibility that the light energy that's absorbed is actually helpful, responsible, maybe even dominating the, the uh, energy that pushes these red blood cells through the capillaries. So here's a, a situation. Um, this is a piece of muscle tissue, and it shows the capillaries, and it shows the red blood cells. And you can see uh, the red blood cells are supposed to look like this, but as they're getting through, 
in order to get through, they have to compress like this. And so, of course, some energy is needed to take these and bend them. And here's a video just showing you uh, the situation. See, and you can see this guy's having a hell of a time working his, his uh, way through. And, and so, so the, the idea that um, the energy uh, might arise from, from light is, comes from the simple observation that we have tubes, and these tubes could be thought of as a, as a blood vessel or a capillary. And in this, in the laboratory, we know that radiant energy, light, drives the flow through. And so, of course, the question arises, might radiant energy help drive the blood flow in your capillaries? Um, and uh, um, so, the question is not answered. However, there, there, was, there are some provocative studies in literature. Um, there's a group that was studying mice. And they took the mice and the mouse. And after their experiment was over, um, they killed the mouse, they sacrificed the mouse, and what they noticed at a measurement of blood flow using optical coherence tomography, it's an advanced method that can actually get beneath the skin and, and actually visualize the capillaries in the flow. The mouse died within one minute after they were sacrificed, but the blood flow continued. So, you know, they were weirded out by this. They, they followed it for one minute, two minutes, five minutes, 30 minutes, one hour, and the blood kept flowing for more than an hour. They repeated the experiment, um, and they got the same result 10 times. Since then, other groups, including us, repeated the experiment in different preparations and got the same result. There is blood flow after death. And we've just completed some experiment, well, completed preliminary experiments, uh, doing exactly this experiment, adding more light, and we achieved an increase of blood flow up to 10 times uh, what existed without the extra light. So we, we think there's a, a good chance that, um, that the blood in your capillaries is actually driven through the capillaries by light or radiant energy. I don't mean visible light, I mean mostly infrared light. Same thing happens inside your cells. Um, so this is a picture of a cell and it, it doesn't adequately represent it because, because it's actually filled with these these uh, macromolecular um, uh, structures, and around each one of these is easy water. So, so the cell is actually, the cells are, are full of easy water, and the, the tight packing means that most of the water inside your cell, your cells are easy water, not H2O, but easy water. And um, your cells are full of easy water. Easy water is negatively charged, therefore, the cell should be negatively charged, and it's well known that the cell has a negative electrical potential. All your cells are minus 80, 90, 70 uh, millivolts, and there's a uh, general thesis that the reason for this has something to do with the membrane pumps and channels, and, and we have evidence that goes against that, but I just want to mention it because this is a generally accepted concept, and we think it actually comes from the water from the negatively charged easy water. And so um, sick cells, uh, for example, are less negative. Um, cancer cells, also pathological kidney cells, minus 10, minus 15, minus 20, instead of minus 80 or minus 90. And so, so if the hypothesis is correct that the negativity comes from the easy water, it implies that there's less easy water, or that these cells are basically dehydrated. And so, the question is, could easy water buildup reverse the pathology or confer improved health? Well, this is still under study now, but um, some indication is, you know, when you walk into the sunlight, or better, if you go into a sauna, um, you know, after you come out, most people go in tired, depressed, with pains and come out feeling like a million dollars. I've had <laughs> the same experience. Um, the sauna is hot. The heat is generating infrared energy. Infrared energy builds easy water. And so possibility is, is that um, 
that the energy coming from sunlight, particularly from the sun, it builds EZs and builds negatively charges and therefore enhances function and health. And we're now studying this, but we think that, that this is a very important um, and central concept for, for building health is building easy water. You might say rehydrating. Most of us are dehydrated. We don't feel thirsty, but we're dehydrated. And so adding the right kind of water, building easy water is good for your health. So I'm not suggesting that, that humans photosynthesize uh, the way plants do, although as I mentioned, there is, a, there is a group of people who believe exactly that um, and are are um, coming through with practical applications. But, so we have some practical applications that come out of this fundamental research, apart from, apart from the health implications, which I believe are absolutely central. And one of them is getting energy from sunlight and water. So you've seen this image before. You have negatively, negative charge, easy water, next to the nucleating surface, and you have positive charge separated. And if you put two electrodes in, you ought to be able to get electrical energy out. Um, and we have a patent on actually on doing this, and here's a simple demonstration uh, that you can, you can uh, get it. So you can see the light from the water. This is from water and sunlight. The chamber here contains water. Um, giving you this and we have a company that we've started to bring these technologies to fruition because this getting electrical energy from water and sunlight is very simple it doesn't deplete the earth of its of its uh, natural resources so this is exciting and equally exciting is um, um, getting drinking water from contaminated water and again this is also we have a patent on this one and the company is working on it, and the principle is very simple, although it looks complicated. Um, so here's a tube, and the tube is, is, for example, naphion or some other substance, and remember there's an EZ here and an EZ here, and all, all of the junk, microspheres, bacteria, whatever, gets pushed to the center. So if you have input flow, that is contaminated water, it comes in, and all the contaminants are confined to the center, and this is basically uh, decontaminated water. It's actually easy water, which is good for health. But anyway, we built a, a collector here. This collector collects the easy water and dumps it here. And all the contaminated stuff gets dumped. And we've been able to separate these two in one pass with a separation of approximately 200 to 1. So it, it, works, it works quite well, and we're now... Um, building up the process because this process produces only a trickle of water and so it needs to be expanded to make, make the water output uh, practical and we're, we're working on that. And one of the exciting issues is, is whether salt can be separated. As I mentioned, we have some preliminary evidence that it can, but we're not absolutely sure. And so the idea is you start with ocean water and you put it in here, and remember there's no physical filter of any sort, and no energy except sunlight to drive this. And if the salt gets separated, then salt will be confined to here, and we dump it, and this water should be salt-free. And so it's possible then to, to get drinking water from ocean water. Okay, so I, I conclude, the main point um, is that water, um, we, we learn as, as children that water contains three phases, ice, liquid, and vapor. And I presented evidence to you that there's a fourth phase. And I put the fourth phase in between the ice and the water because we have evidence, uh, published evidence, that if you want to freeze the water to go from here to here, you must, it's obligatory to pass through this phase in order to get to here. And it's no surprise because this structure is similar to this structure, slight difference. And if you want to melt water, you go from here to this phase and then to water. So this is obligatory, which is the reason why I put it right here. And the implications are many. Um, the, the main sort of central point is that the water is always absorbing radiant energy and this radiant energy is converted to other kinds of energy. It has implications, biological implications. Uh, I've just given you one 
possible example of helping to drive blood flow in your body. It has implications for aqueous chemistry because, because the current ideas, current interpretations don't involve separation of charge, easy build up, the role of light. But her evidence suggests that this is critical, central to all the interpretations. In terms of weather, so you listen to the weather forecast and, and the weather forecaster says, oh, well, you know, there's high pressure coming and the temperature and so on. Those are the two variables now that are used uniformly to predict the weather. And as you know, the weather is not always so predictable. And I think uh, what's missing from the equation is the role of charge. We know that the clouds are charged. You can see evidence of it when you, when you see lightning. And um, in my next book that's coming, it explores in detail the role of charge. And I think charge is actually far more central to understanding the weather than is temperature or pressure. And the easy water plays a, a, a central role in all of this. For health, implication of what I was talking about is that is that easy water is what fills your cells and in order for you to be healthy you have to have a full complement of easy water if you're missing you're dehydrated you need to build it up to build up the negative charge in your cell and we found that um, that some of the of the you might say uh, natural um, health um, in ingredients, the stuff that you take in order to become healthy, actually build easy water. The simplest is aspirin. So we took a chamber with easy, we put aspirin in the water, and, and in clinical doses, easy builds. We found the same for Tylenol, for example. We've studied um, uh, coconut uh, water, which is generally thought to be good for your health, it builds easy water. We've taken Tulsi, which is used in India and such commonly builds easy water. At the same time, substances that are not good for your health um, impair the builder or compromise the amount of easy water. And that, that includes glyphosate, for example, uh, in Roundup, uh, herbicide. And, and so, so we think it's actually possible that the easy water may be central to your health, absolutely central, and that agents that build it up will be good for your health, and agents that diminish it will be not good for your health. In terms of food, if you want to hydrate or dehydrate or such, you need to know how, uh, about the water and, uh, in order to do it effectively and efficiently. And then some very practical kinds of things about filtration. I've demonstrated to you that you can build a filter, a so-called filterless filter, without a physical filter, uh, without energy that can that um, can remove contaminants from, from water, a possibility for desalination and getting electricity from water. Um, next to the last slide is something completely unrelated but very important. We, we uh, actually put together the Institute for Venture Science. And this institute, which is now uh, beginning to function, it's for funding promising ideas that challenge conventional thinking. There's been very little of this. There used to be a lot of it a century ago. Revolutions were occurring at the rate of practically one every year or two. Now there are lots of technological developments, but almost no fundamental scientific breakthroughs or revolutions. And this is designed to change that. And um, uh, here is the, the website, if, if it's of interest to look further. We're actually reviewing now pre-proposals, just ideas um, that are presented that can change the world, potentially, and we're in the process of reviewing them. So I, I end with, with the book, which is actually quite popular, uh, that describes what I've uh, been, been telling you about. It's called The Fourth Phase of Water, and <laughs> I'm very happy to tell you that two days ago, uh, the film called The Fourth Phase just opened um, in, in L.A. It's actually... It's actually um, a sports action uh, movie. Um, it's about snowboarding, and the, the producer and the main character is Travis Rice, who's a legendary snowboarder. So if you watch it, you'll see lots of unbelievable snowboarding, 
And woven into it is the idea of easy water um, involved in, in, in rain and snow and stuff like that. And so I won't win an Academy Award for my 30 minutes in it, but it's a very exciting kind of uh, yeah, presentation, and I'm flattered that it has a name for it. And at the very end, after the credits, um, you can see the star Travis Rice in his campsite reading this book. So <laughs> it's cool. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>